Good morning, everybody. Uh, today is November 17th, and I need to begin with a very sincere apology um, because I messed up, and most of you probably thought that on Sunday or over the weekend. I didn't actually hear from anyone on it, though. Uh, the quiz was not supposed to be due on Sunday. Uh, who in here took it in the classroom? Did y'all? Yeah, yeah. Um, the quiz was actually supposed to open this Thursday. I messed up uh, when I was programming all the different dates in Canvas. Apparently, I just clicked the wrong dates. And so, obviously, many of you took quiz six already. And there's certainly nothing wrong with that. But I think some of you would have liked a little bit more time to prepare. Is that fair enough? Uh, and it looks like I know I know you, but did y'all kind of wonder why it was due? Were y'all kind of curious about that? Yeah, yeah, okay, so here's the thing, okay, um, the quiz is open again for anyone that didn't take it, okay, I'm actually going to keep the quiz open even longer than Sunday, there's no reason why Sunday it should be due, after all, uh, we do have a few more lectures after Thanksgiving, and so there's no reason to, to make the quiz due right away, quiz six that is, or the discussion questions, now if you've already done it, that's fine, uh, but if you want more time, obviously you have more time. And I've got to find some way to make this up to the class, find some way to, to give you some points or something, because I know some of you probably took it and didn't necessarily feel as prepared as you should. So once again, I screwed up. Sorry, the quiz was not supposed to be due Sunday, but I noticed many of you did. Uh, nevertheless, uh, I'm as human as the rest of us, I guess. So that's what that's all about. As a matter of fact, I'm getting kind of senile. I don't know if that's obvious up here, but I, I am kind of losing it. So. I'll do my best to hang on until I'm eligible to retire, I suppose. Okay, well, with that in mind, um, the quiz will, well, the quiz is open now, uh, and we'll just, we'll just keep on trucking. Now, let's get to the course material. Uh, by the mid-1850s, the sectional crisis was very apparent. Uh, the North and the South had both largely dug their heels in on the issue of slavery, or more specifically, the expansion of slavery. The North, we will just, I guess, call them the Union. Uh, they, generally speaking, the leaders and the population openly consider slavery wrong, openly consider slavery something that at some point will have to come to an end. They're not advocating an end to it. I cannot emphasize that enough. The, you know, the abolitionists in the North were a very tiny percentage of the population. But overwhelmingly, Northerners did not want to see slavery expand west. They, they, their logic was, you know, the new states that will be added to the Union need to be free states. The South, on the other hand, had exactly the opposite view. Uh, you, you know, slavery must move west. Slavery must be part of new states that are added to the Union. Otherwise, uh, we're going to be outnumbered in Washington. You know, the, the Congress will be dominated by free states. Free states will choose the president. Federal judges will be appointed by free state presidents. We will eventually see a federal government hostile to slavery, which means that we will simply want to form our own country. And Southern states are openly discussing the idea of secession. Let's just leave the United States, form a nation where every state is a slave state, where it's not possible to uh, concern ourselves with this issue anymore. And the United States can go its separate way, and that will be that. If it goes too far. And the Republican Party is a big part of this because once the Republican Party has now become popular in the North, and I mean, it skyrocketed to popularity very quickly. Southerners are arguing, if you elect one of those Republicans, we're out because the Republicans were adamant not to let slavery expand. And that sort of, to many Southerners, would represent a line being crossed. I mentioned that the Supreme Court finally decided to take up the issue. The Congress is now incapable of sorting it out. We have a series of weak presidents that are clearly not doing what they need to do to, to, to try and sort this out, not that they realistically could. So in the Dred Scott case, the Supreme Court ruled basically everything that the South would want. Uh, Dred Scott moving into federal territory did not make him a free man. And this meant that the federal government cannot stop slavery in the territories. You know, slavery should be able to expand wherever it wants because slaves are legally property. And although the Dred Scott decision is frequently put out there as, as a horrible decision by the court, morally speaking, it certainly would be. The problem is, with people that criticize the Dred Scott decision, 
uh, it happens to be legally accurate. You know, Roger Tawney, as bigoted as he was, was speaking the truth when he said we were a nation founded upon the principles that slavery is acceptable, that, that the, uh, the children of Africa, if you will, are legally suited for slavery. That was the principles of the Constitution, and it was perfectly legal. And if we want to change that, it can't be done through the courts. The courts simply cannot rule something different. We need to have laws that eliminate slavery or we need to accept it. We, we, have to, we have to take a stand on this. And so in many ways, what Roger Taney is doing is pointing a finger at the United States and saying, you got to figure this out. You know, you're going to have to do the heavy lifting and as a people, figure out what you want to do with slavery. Well, things still can get worse and the tension can still become even higher. And in October of 1859, that's exactly what happened. You will recall John Brown. Let's go back a little bit here and see if we can find him. There he is. This man who was probably schizophrenic, but nonetheless aggressively anti-slavery, in Kansas, he and a small group of followers had hacked to death a number of pro-slavery settlers at what would be called the Potawatomi Creek Massacre. John Brown only becomes more aggressive after that. And in 1859, October, he and a small group of followers decided that they were going to spark an anti-slavery uprising throughout the South. Now, let me point out, we are talking about a man who is delusional here. This is not something that is realistically going to happen, not by a mile. This is what's going on in his own head. He and his followers concluded that if we could arm local slaves near the nation's capital, if we could get some guns into the hands of a few slaves, they will turn on their white masters, and before you know it, we will have a snowball effect, and a slave uprising will take place all across the South, and that will, of course, mean the end of slavery. And John Brown believed that, of course, slave owners and everyone having to do with slavery deserve to die a very painful death. So he and a small group of followers raided a small federal arsenal at Harper's Ferry, Virginia. Now, an arsenal is, of course, where guns are kept. And this was, you know, it was a building with guns in it. That's, that's it. You know, and there were a couple of guards at the building. And that's, you know, kind of how, how guns are stored. It was an insignificant little federal arsenal at Harper's Ferry. Harper's Ferry is just a few miles outside of Washington, D.C. And so he and his men charged into the arsenal, took over the place, and declared that a slave uprising had begun. And what he's thinking is, of course, we can get these guns out to the local black population. They will then start shooting whites left and right. This will spread into Washington, D.C. We will have a huge black uprising in the nation's capital. And it will just, again, it will cascade throughout the South. Well, obviously, again, this is a delusional concept. This is not going to happen as Brown intended. What ended up happening is he and his buddies were barricaded inside the arsenal and very quickly the town turned on him. Federal soldiers were called in and a small little group overran the arsenal, killed several of Brown's followers, and Brown was arrested. The man who led this was Robert E. Lee you know, a colonel that lived just outside of Washington, D.C., actually lived in Washington, D.C., and he was, a, he was a military officer this time, of course, in the U.S. Army. And it only took a couple of dozen soldiers, you know, they surrounded the place, and that was the end of that. But this made the papers, and John Brown was, of course, put on trial for treason. Several people had been killed in his taking of the arsenal, and so, 
in that sense, he's kind of a murderer. Now, at John Brown's trial, he was completely unapologetic. And he took this as an opportunity to just lecture against the evils of slavery. And, of course, pointing out that he had no problem whatsoever with the mass murder of anyone having to do with slavery. You know, it is perfectly within the rights of these black people to rise up and kill anyone who is trying to keep them in bondage. And he made it clear the only way slavery will end is through violent uprising. Obviously, it will never end through political action. It's going to take something like this. John Brown was, of course, found guilty. You know, he did not deny that he had done this. And shortly after this, he was hanged in the nation's capital. Well, now, I want us to do a little psychology here. I want us to get into the headspace of the American public. The John Brown raid made national news. Unlike the Dred Scott Rebellion, which had been suppressed by the Southern Papers, this one people knew about. Now, here is a man who has openly admitted to murdering people in Kansas, who hadn't hurt anybody, although they were slave owners. Now he has raided a federal arsenal, killed several people doing that, and is openly calling for the violent murder of families throughout the South. Not just the men that owned the slaves on the plantations, but the wives, the children, you name it. I want a bloody rebellion all across the Southern states. Now, I don't know about you, but a man that openly calls for my murder and the murder of my children is a terrorist in my book. And I'm certainly not going to have any sympathy for him when he gets put on trial and found guilty of treason. Take a wild guess what happened in the North. He was praised as a hero. He is a martyr. Abolitionists, you know, held him up as a, as a brave man who is willing to die for this cause. And so this really, really makes the South angry. It is one thing to advocate an end to slavery. It is one thing to aggressively want to see slavery end. But when you are openly supporting someone who wants to see me murdered, that's going to make me mad. That's going to make me very angry. When you're openly praising a man that would like to see my children murdered, that is not, that's not cool. Even those that don't like slavery should see what John Brown is doing as terrorism and far from acceptable. Any end to slavery would have to be done through political peaceful means. That is how we're supposed to do things in this country, through democracy. Well, anyway, all kinds of songs were uh, written for him. There's mock funerals all across the North. John Brown is being praised as a hero. And Southerners are just absolutely boiling over with anger when they hear that this sort of stuff is taking place. And again, I know that it's not the same. Don't get me wrong. I get that there's a difference here. But... When we hear of like the 9-11 attacks, when those you know, terrorists flew the planes into the buildings and all of those thousands of Americans were killed, anyone that would praise those men that flew those planes into the building is not going to be my friend. And anyone that would say, well, those are actually really nice guys because they're fighting. For, I don't give a damn what you're fighting for. When you murder children, you're not a good person. And so that's kind of the mentality that the South had. How could we possibly praise someone? who is calling for this, no matter what the nobility of his cause may be. Well, that's the mood that we have going into the year 1860. And the North and the South are about as divided culturally as any people can be on this issue. There does not appear to be any way that this can somehow be resolved politically or within, you know, within reasonable processes. And, of course, we have an election, don't we? 1860 is an election year. Oh boy. 
This one's going to be interesting. First, President Buchanan is not interested in a second term. He never liked being president to begin with, and he is not going to run for re-election. And it doesn't appear that he could even win the Democratic nomination if he could, or if he chose to. That is going to open the door for Stephen Douglas. That is going to open the door for Stephen Douglas. And the emergence of Honest Abe himself. Whoops. There we go. The emergence of Lincoln. So who are these people? Well, we've already talked about Stephen Douglas. Stephen Douglas is a senator from Illinois. He is very ambitious. He doesn't hide the fact that he wants to be president. He's been pushing for it for years. His big, uh, his big deal was pushing forward Kansas, Nebraska, so we could get a transcontinental railroad built. And we are on track to make that happen, just to let you know. The wheels are in motion already to build that transcontinental railroad. And so Stephen Douglas has got some props there. Well, who is Abraham Lincoln? Well, first and foremost, Abraham Lincoln was born and raised in a very common household. He was also from Illinois, just like Douglas. You know, kind of a yeoman pioneer family. His mother died when he was young, so he was raised largely by his father. He had a frontier upbringing in the sense that he did not receive much formal education. You know, he was a perfectly fine young man. He was known to be very healthy, very strong. He had a reputation for being a good wrestler for whatever that's worth, right? Later in the, when he is running for president, one of his, uh, one of his things is that he split, he split fence posts. You know, when you're building fences, you have to have an ax and you, you put a, you put a little wedge in between a, 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 a big stump or like a big piece of wood and then you whack it and that wedge splits the wood to make the fence posts and it's really hard work. You know, it's back breaking and Lincoln was said to be able to just really, you know, wall up those fence posts and do a good job with it. He was tall and he was physically, you know, kind of strong. He was a, he was a tall dude. As a young man, he became a lawyer, a frontier lawyer as we would call him traveling around Illinois, taking up various domestic cases. And he was darn good at it. Although largely self-educated, he was a very intelligent man. And by the 1840s, he was a very successful Illinois lawyer. He and his wife lived in Springfield. In 1846, he served one term in the U.S. Congress as a Whig. And it's also worth mentioning that as a young man, he had served in the Black Hawk War as a private, although he probably didn't do any fighting. But he did briefly serve as a private in the Illinois militia in the Black Hawk War. He serves one term in Congress as a Whig, but then after that goes back to Illinois and continues to practice law, but he is sort of pushed into leadership. You know, a lot of people around Illinois, you see, you know, young Mr. Lincoln is somebody who can, who can really make a bright future for himself. And so there's this idea, maybe he'll go back to Congress, maybe he'll run for governor, you know, he's going to do something. He's going to do something. In 1858, we have the midterm elections. And the Senate seat, one of the Senate seats in Illinois is open, and Abraham Lincoln decides to run for it as a Republican. You know, the Whig Party has now collapsed, and Lincoln becomes a Republican. Stephen Douglas runs for it as a Democrat. 
And this is actually just a re-election for Stephen Douglas, of course. It's not really an open seat. It's just the election year is here. And what makes this important is that we are now at the peak of these debates over slavery. Slavery and its expansion, slavery and its future in this country. And of course, the people of Illinois don't want to see slavery expand. Douglas, as a Democrat, is a little bit more sympathetic to slavery than the Republicans. You know, he's more a fan of letting people decide for themselves. Popular sovereignty is what he had pushed. And so he and Lincoln begin to engage on the campaign trail in a series of debates. And the two men gained a great respect for each other. You know, politically they were different. Lincoln is trying to get the seat that Douglas has. And just to let you know, Douglas sometimes spelled his name with one S and sometimes spelled it with two. So I guess we'll just use one S. And these debates, even though they were just for the Illinois Senate, get picked up by national newspapers. And just to let you know, newspapers are always looking for something to print. You know, newspapers always need material. You know, they always need copy. And so these debates were from two very intelligent, very politically eloquent men. And they really are a debate over whether or not slavery should expand, with Douglas saying, yes, let it expand. Let the people make their own decisions here. You know, federal territory, the Dred Scott decision, yeah, you know, it's, it's okay for slavery to expand if the people want it. It's, it's, the, it's the democracy that matters. And Lincoln is saying, no, slavery should not expand. Slavery should not be allowed to move west. And the Lincoln-Douglas debates were a pretty darn big deal even though they really are just for the Illinois Senate. Spoiler alert, Douglas wins the Senate race. Lincoln does not win. And that really didn't surprise anyone. You know, he's kind of the incumbent. He's better known. What matters is that Abraham Lincoln has now made a name for himself. And local newspapers have picked him up, and Republican leaders are looking for someone to take the helm and possibly take the 1860 nomination. And this guy Lincoln, man, maybe he's got something here. So in 1860, pushed by his friends, Lincoln decides to launch a campaign for president. And it's worth noting, he did not think he would get the Republican nomination going in. There were other Republicans that were more prominent. Lincoln just had a really good team behind him who played a lot of games behind the scenes to get Lincoln more, to, more votes at the convention. But Abraham Lincoln, in 1860, receives the Republican Party nomination. And in many ways, we could, we could consider him what would be called a dark horse candidate, someone who nobody is really expecting and isn't especially well known. By just about any measure, Abraham Lincoln is the most obscure presidential candidate we had had up to this point. Every other presidential candidate was already well known and well established whenever they finally ran. You know, the first several presidents were all founding fathers, and so that sort of speaks for them. And then, of course, John Quincy Adams had been Secretary of State. Andrew Jackson was Andrew Jackson. You get the idea. You know, every one of them had served in a very prominent political role and really had a good reason to be president. Lincoln is the first guy to kind of come out of nowhere with no real political experience at all. One term in Congress 15 years ago doesn't really count. Now, the Democrats, on the other hand, at the 1860 convention, were absolutely chaotically divided. The slavery issue had come to tear the Democratic Party apart. Northern Democrats refusing to endorse anybody that would support the expansion of slavery. Southern Democrats insisting that it has to be part of the platform. 
And to make matters worse, the Democratic Convention took place in Charleston, South Carolina, which was the hotbed of the pro-slavery movement. Nobody was more aggressively pro-slavery than the people of South Carolina. And Charleston was where the Democrats held their convention, which was a bad idea. And they fought, and they argued, and they screamed, and they yelled, and they called each other names, and the Northern Democrats refused to work with the Southern Democrats, and they couldn't even come up with any kind of real party platform. And finally, when it was all said and done, the Democratic Party could not pick a unified candidate. They finally just ended up not making it happen. And so, in the 1860 election, there were two Democratic candidates. And there was even a third party called the Constitutional Union Party, which was a splinter group that decided to nominate their own guy. The Republican Party was so hated in the South that Southern states did not even put Abraham Lincoln on the ticket in many cases. So in several Southern states, you could not vote for Lincoln even if you wanted to. And in the 60 election, there were actually two separate tickets. In the North, you could choose between Stephen Douglas, yes, he got the Northern nomination just like he wanted, or if you wanted to vote Republican, you could vote for Lincoln. So if you lived in a northern state, that was your option. Vote for Stephen Douglas or vote for Abraham Lincoln. In the South, you could vote for John Breckinridge, the Southern Democratic nominee. Or you could vote for John Bell, the Constitutional Union candidate. But like I said, in most Southern, in the, particularly in the Deep South, Lincoln wasn't on the ticket. So you weren't voting for him even if you wanted to. Not that many Southerners would. So the 1860 election was just pure chaos. And you know, I would hate to see a chaotic presidential election, right? You know, that's, uh, you know... What really matters, though, is that once the election is over, you know, the winner needs to be the winner and the loser needs to be the loser and everybody needs to agree, right? Heck, even then they could do, even with this, they agreed on that one. That's a scary part. Well, the Deep South began to argue that should Lincoln win the election, they would simply secede from the Union. A firm movement began emerging to simply form a new country should the Republicans actually win and Lincoln get the White House. Because what that would mean, of course, is that the Congress is now owned by anti-slavery people. Now the White House is owned by anti-slavery people. It is unlikely that the South will ever get a pro-slavery president again. That means the federal courts. I keep going over that, but that's what we have to keep in mind. So throughout the South, a movement before the election emerges, should Lincoln win, that's it, we're done. We're just going to break away, form our own nation, let the United States go its own separate way. Well, everybody already knows what happens. Lincoln won. Lincoln won the election. He won in the Electoral College. He did not win a single slave state. But that was okay. There were enough free states in the Union to give Lincoln 51% in the Electoral College. Douglas won Missouri, John Bell won Virginia, Kentucky, and Tennessee. Breckinridge, the Southern Democrat, won the South for the most part. But Lincoln won the North. And this electoral map really freaked people out. I want y'all to take a look at it for a second. This electoral map was a really big deal because what this means, of course, is that you can become president without winning a single southern state, can't you? So in future elections, the North can just 
pick the president every single time. The South will no longer be able to really have a say. And remember, we're going to be adding new states in the West. See all that gray area? Those are all going to be new states moving forward. And of course, with Lincoln in the White House and the North dominating the Congress, all of those are going to be free states. And so it's, it's obvious. The non-slaveholding states will always pick the president moving forward. They don't need us. They don't need us. And then with control in Washington, they can impose any kind of anti-slavery law they want on us. Why on earth would we want to stay in a union if that's the case? So you can understand why this electoral map is so troubling. Lincoln did not win a single Southern state, yet he still could become president. So when we wrap our head around that, it becomes very clear why the South felt so threatened. Now, as I mentioned, South Carolina is the hotbed of this fear, this, this idea that we will now be dominated by the North and they will start getting rid of slavery. And I'll just ask you, why is South Carolina such a hotbed? Why would the people of South Carolina have much stronger feelings about this more than any other Southern state? What do you think might be the reason for that? You know, why not Virginia? Why not North Carolina? Why not Georgia? I mean, why is the secessionist sentiment so crazy strong in South Carolina? Anybody, anybody have any ideas? It has to do with demographics. South Carolina has the largest black population. And South Carolina, more than any other southern state, is lopsided in terms of whites versus blacks. As a matter of fact, there are more blacks in South Carolina than there are whites at this time. And so the white people of South Carolina are absolutely scared to death of what might happen if slavery ends. And of course, South Carolina is dominated by the large plantation owners more than any other state. The South Carolina planters own that state and they are the wealthiest people in the country. And they have so much invested in slavery, those big rice plantations, that they're not even going to consider the idea of slavery being threatened. There was a group of very wealthy, large slaveholding politicians who were so aggressively pro-slavery, unwilling to discuss anything having to do with ending it, aggressively pro-secession, aggressively hating the North, and they would be nicknamed the fire eaters because they were just so unwilling to be reasonable, be reasonable about this issue in any way. You know, the extremists, if you will. And these, you know, these were dominating South Carolina politics, but you can find them in other places too. The very hint of anything having to do with rights for black people or ending slavery or discussing it or, you know, I mean, they're just radically, radically against any of it. And, and so they were nicknamed the fire eaters. And the fire eaters are the ones that are really pushing for secession. You know, form our own country. Get rid of the connection to the United States altogether. Well, shortly after the election, about six weeks later, with Lincoln now the president-elect, the legislature of South Carolina met and unanimously voted to secede from the United States. Not a single dissenting vote. They are thus declaring South Carolina an independent nation. So we now have our nation's greatest constitutional crisis. What do we do if a state simply says it is no longer in the United States anymore? Over the next few weeks, other deep South states did the same thing. Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, declaring themselves out of the Union. Now, the mechanisms were a little different. Some states had the legislature do it. Some states actually held their own election. You know, they held a vote on it, and they let the people vote, should we secede or not. And what we also see is that this is not as unanimously popular as it was in South Carolina. There was a, a pretty strong pro-union movement in Mississippi, for example. 
Jefferson Davis, who would become the president of the Confederacy, did not want to secede. He was actually pro-Union until Mississippi did secede, and then he, then he got on board. But before it all happened, Jefferson Davis actually argued that Mississippi should not secede. Nevertheless, the, the majority wanted it. We now have celebrations popping up all over the place. You know, we are no longer in the United States. These southern states, of course, quickly came together and created a single country calling themselves the Confederate States of America. The federal government in Washington, D.C. melts down into complete chaos. With the congressmen and senators from these states, of course, packing up and leaving. Nobody really knows, is this going to stick? What's the government going to do? There's legal arguments. Can a state legally leave the union? Is this even, you know, is this even constitutional? And obviously that all just depends on your perspective, I suppose. President Buchanan wants nothing to do with this problem. He refuses to take any action on it. In fact, aside from arguing that he doesn't support it and he doesn't think the South can do this, that's about all he does. I mean, he makes it very clear this is a... This is Lincoln's problem, not his. You know, I'm leaving, I'm packing up. In the spring of 1861, and again, we're fudging the dates here because each state is different, the Upper South starts to secede. Missouri is deeply divided. Tennessee, North Carolina, and later Virginia. And so now we have a large section. But as we get into the Upper South, as I, as I brought up, there's a lot of debate. You know, Upper South citizens are not so sure about this. And not every slave state officially joined the Confederacy. As I mentioned, Missouri was kind of divided, and Missouri never officially joined the Confederacy. Kentucky is a slave state, and it did not secede. Delaware is a slave state. It did not secede. You know, there was a, there, you know, it was, it was not something the majority were willing to do. So not every slave state was willing to join. But the problem for the Union is that Virginia did join the Confederacy. Now, I'll just ask you, why is Virginia joining the Confederacy a problem? We'll go back to this map and you can see. Can anybody tell me why Virginia joining the Confederacy is a big deal? Why is this one the one that's going to really, really cause a problem? Well, Washington, D.C. sits on the border between Virginia and Maryland, doesn't it? D.C. is in between. And so if Virginia joins the Confederacy, that puts these Confederates right on the border of the nation's capital. And remember, Maryland is a slave state, isn't it? And so what were to happen? You can see that little gray square there. That's Washington, D.C. You can barely see it. You at home, I don't think you can, but it's, you know, you should know where Washington is. But Washington is right here. You know, this is Virginia, and then the green here, that's Maryland. If Maryland secedes and joins the Confederacy as well, and Maryland is a southern slave state too, then our nation's capital is now surrounded by the Confederacy. At that point, it is unrealistic to think that the Union can be held together. What do you do when your own capital is now in seceded territory? So we have got a serious crisis with Virginia out. And it's game over if Maryland leaves too. So Abraham Lincoln has inherited the biggest constitutional crisis our nation has ever seen. Very quickly, the Confederacy established a provisional capital in Montgomery, Alabama. 
here is some uh, here is some propaganda here that's always fun to look at. Here we'll go to this. Here it is. The Confederacy established a provisional capital in Montgomery, Alabama, and chose Mississippian Jefferson Davis as the provisional president. You know, the first president of the Confederacy. Jefferson Davis. Now, exactly who is Jefferson Davis? Who, who is this guy and why would they choose him? Well, Jefferson Davis was himself a highly qualified politician. On paper, there is no doubt that he is the man for this job given all that is happening. Jefferson Davis was a Mississippi planter. He had a big old plantation near Vicksburg. He was a West Point graduate. He had served as an officer in the Mexican War. Now remember, these planter families all send their sons to military academies, or an awful lot of them do, and so lots of military officers in the U.S. military come from Southern planter families. Jefferson Davis was just one of them. But later, he was elected to the U.S. Senate. And in the 1850s, served as the U.S. Secretary of War, which today we call Secretary of Defense. So he had military experience. He was highly educated. He had plenty of political experience, served as the Secretary of War. This man is clearly qualified for this type of job. I mean, he would have been a very valid presidential contender in the United States as well, for obvious reasons. So it was, and again, as I mentioned earlier, he was not interested in secession at first. He actually wanted to find some way to reconcile. But once the South did secede, he was pushed for the job because of his qualifications, and he reluctantly accepted. Now, who, of course, is he going against? On the other side will be President Lincoln, a man whose only military experience was a private in the Black Hawk War for a few months, never had any formal education, only served one term in Congress as a Whig and didn't do anything there. You know, side by side, Davis is going to crush Lincoln in terms of leadership ability. Are y'all following me? Now, of course, what ended up happening is the exact opposite. You know, Lincoln proved to be, you know, possibly the greatest leader we've ever had, and Jefferson Davis proved largely ineffective as president of the Confederacy. And it really wasn't its fault. The Confederate government was ineffective. I mean, you know, he inherited a, a government that just could not get its act together. But nonetheless, Lincoln was this brilliant president. Davis is generally regarded as having been ineffective. So sometimes what it looks like on paper is not how it turns out. What Lincoln did have going for him, which was misunderstood from the very beginning, is the fact that Lincoln was an absolutely brilliant legal mind. He understood the Constitution. He understood U.S. law code. He understood on a very fundamental level what the law said. And so once he got into office, he was able to use that to his advantage to get what he wanted. And we see this early with preventing Maryland from leaving. We see this with the Emancipation Proclamation, pushing through the 13th Amendment later on, all of the different complexities with trying to organize the war effort. When it came to the law, Lincoln was an absolute chess master. And nobody thought that he would be, because again, no formal education. It was all self for that, you know, for the most part. Well, the first thing Lincoln had to do was prevent Maryland from seceding. Because of course, again, if we look at this map, if Maryland secedes from the Union, it's game over. Virginia is in the Confederacy, Maryland is in the Confederacy, the nation's capital is surrounded by the Confederacy, Obviously, Washington, D.C. will simply become the Confederate capital, and that'll be the end of it. The U.S. government will simply have to withdraw to the north, and that's that. So what Lincoln really has to think about 
Or here's another little propaganda piece here. Once it all gets set up, you know, we have uh, we have Davis on one side and Lincoln on the other, and of course the United States is being torn apart. What Lincoln has to deal with is the fact that not only is the nation's capital in southern territory, but who knows what soldiers are loyal to him. Remember, so many military officers were from southern planter families. They're packing up and going home. You know, they're packing up and leaving and joining the Confederacy and offering their services to the Confederate government. And so Lincoln is putting out a call for soldiers to come to the Capitol to try to defend the Capitol and keep everything in order. And, of course, some are showing up and some aren't. Different officers are, are, are pledging different loyalties. Robert E. Lee, who was generally regarded as uh, the most talented officer we have, he had a big plantation that was actually his wife's right next to the White House, Arlington Plantation. Robert E. Lee left and joined Virginia, joined the Confederacy. And so Lincoln doesn't know what he's going to do. But there was one man that Lincoln turned to, hoping to God that he could count on, and this is the last man you would, you would think, and that is Winfield Scott. Yes, Winfield Scott. Winfield Scott, as I mentioned, was an officer in the War of 1812. He had played a big role in the Indian removals. He was, of course, the hero of the Mexican War. Winfield Scott in 1861 was very old, extremely overweight, definitely needed to be retired at that point. And remember, Winfield Scott himself was also from a Virginia planter family. And Winfield Scott is the most respected officer in the U.S. military. He is the grand old man. Nobody expects him to have any kind of active role in the military, but he is still an active general, and everybody respects Winfield Scott. And so Lincoln turned to Winfield Scott and said, I need you. You know, I need your help, because if I don't, uh, if I don't keep Maryland in the Union, this is game over. And he doesn't even know what Scott's going to tell him. What do you think Scott told him? Now, remember, we're talking about a man from Virginia here. What was Scott's answer, if you had to guess? And quite literally, when Lincoln met with him, he didn't know what Scott was going to do. You know, Robert E. Lee has now joined the Confederacy. All of these officers are joining the Confederacy back where their families are. Winfield Scott looked at Lincoln and said, I am 100% loyal. He said, there is absolutely no way I will turn on you. I am going to put out orders right now to tell every officer to stop leaving and I am going to make sure that Maryland stays in the Union no matter what. And of course, Lincoln breathed an enormous sigh of relief. And I bring this up because when people talk about the Civil War, when scholars talk about this, everybody knows that Scott was in charge when the war first began, but he's generally given sort of this minor role because very quickly when the war started, he retired and got out of the picture. But the reality is Scott saved the Union. Because Scott immediately put out an order to all the U.S. military officers, you have to stay loyal, I am staying loyal, we have to stop Maryland from leaving. And a whole class of officers that would probably have stepped aside or not listened to Lincoln stepped up and took orders from Scott. So there we have it. Anyway, Scott made it clear to Lincoln, I am not about to support the South. This is treason, this is wrong. You know, all of these military officers that are leaving have... Uh, you know, pledge loyalty to the U.S., and they're going back on their word, and no way. Anyway, Winfield Scott sent the officers that he could throughout Maryland. They arrested every single member of the Maryland legislature without any charge to stop the legislature from meeting and joining the Confederacy, which was blatantly unconstitutional and illegal, and Lincoln and Scott didn't give a damn. So automatically, we see Lincoln being willing to do just about anything to keep the Union together. So Maryland remained in the Union, and now Lincoln has a fighting chance. Washington now has loyal American soldiers there, but of course, we're still very early on. The United States has all types of federal facilities throughout the country. You know, post offices, for example, are property of the federal government. And what matters here, of course, is that the United States has forts throughout the country. 
you know, we have various fortifications all along our border and places like that. And of course, in every fort is a contingent of U.S. soldiers. Well, when the secession crisis began, these forts started being taken over by the Confederacy. You know, Southern soldiers would show up and tell the U.S. soldiers, get out of Dodge, this is our fort now. And in most cases, these forts simply surrendered without a fight, and the soldiers packed up and went back, went back north. Well, there were two forts that didn't do it. One was Fort Pickens off the coast of Florida, but it doesn't matter. In Charleston Harbor, again, Charleston is the hotbed of secession here. In Charleston Harbor, there was a fort, Fort Sumter. And why did I put it in there? Even I'm guilty of that sometimes. Fort Sumter. Now this is the fort guarding the entry to Charleston. This is the fort guarding the entry to Charleston. And there is a, you know, a small understaffed battalion of American soldiers, probably not even battalion strength, that man Fort Sumter. And when South Carolina seceded from the Union, the commander of Fort Sumter would not turn the fort over to South Carolina. He insisted, this is the United States and Fort Sumter is an American fort. And I will not surrender it to anybody, even people in South Carolina who claim to have seceded. And for weeks, Fort Sumter simply does not surrender because the commander will not do it. President Buchanan tried a couple of times to resupply Fort Sumter and the ships sent were turned back. Negotiations to surrender Fort Sumter keep going back and forth, but the commander will not turn it over to the South. And so Lincoln sends him an order, do not turn it over. Lincoln likes this. Lincoln thinks this is, a, this is good. The South, in early April, demanded that Fort Sumter surrender or that it would be taken by force because this is no longer a U.S. fort, according to the South. Now, it is worth noting, by April, the South is organizing its own army now. The Confederacy is putting together its own military. And all of the officers in the Confederate Army are former officers in the Union Army. You know, these were American officers before they joined the South. And so these really are officers that all know each other, squaring off against each other. And throughout the entire war, officers that had attended West Point together or attended military academies together ended up squaring off against each other on the battlefield. And in some cases, very close friends in the two officer corps were actually fighting each other. There's many, many instances of that men that were friends before the war, but you went to the South and I went to the North, and so now we're on the opposite side. And that's what happened here. Um, on April 10th, Jefferson Davis ordered a Southern general, a man by the name of PGT Beauregard, you don't have to write him down, to take the fort by force. And this was after Lincoln tried to supply the fort more than once. And so on April 12th, after negotiations failed, the South opened fire on Fort Sumter and bombarded it for about 24 hours straight. And it is worth noting, Beauregard was very good friends with the commander of the fort. The two men knew each other well. They had attended West Point together. The man's name was Anderson, something like that. After 24 hours, Fort Sumter surrendered, but of course that means the war has now started. Only one Union soldier was killed in the attack on Fort Sumter. 
Abraham Lincoln called for 70,000 volunteers to serve for 90 days to suppress the rebellion, which of course now is openly and violently taking place. You know, there is now a clear rebellion going on. We've started shooting at each other. There were a few other little skirmishes, usually in Northern Virginia. You know, in a Virginia town, they would run and take down the American flag and raise the Confederate flag and a couple of loyalists would shoot at them. And, you know, Northern Virginia was very divided. You know, there were plenty of unionists there too. A large section of Virginia refused to join with the state and seceded from the Confederacy because Western Virginia was very pro-Union. And so that would later become the state of West Virginia because the people of West Virginia did not want to join the Confederacy. And so later they would be turned into their own state and they would become a state during the war. Like I said, Delaware, which was a slave state and in many ways a southern state, did not join the Confederacy. I mentioned that earlier. Kentucky and Missouri did not officially join, but unofficially quite a few Kentucky and Missouri soldiers did fight in the Confederate armies. The Confederacy started raising its own army to fight, of course, for southern independence. And the Confederacy chose Richmond, Virginia to be the capital. The provisional capital was moved from Montgomery to Richmond. And the Confederacy would hold a presidential election. And of course, Jefferson Davis was elected. So now he is not the provisional president. He is the duly elected presidency president of the Confederate States of America with the permanent capital now, Richmond, Virginia. And here is the proclamation from Lincoln declaring that there is a rebellion at hand calling for 75,000 volunteers to put it down over the course of three months. Boy, isn't that naive, right? <laughs> My goodness. Now, of course, thousands and thousands and thousands of young men started showing up to volunteer to fight on both sides. Lines were, of course, stretched down the street in towns and cities all across both the North and the South. This is going to be a grand adventure, of course. You know, the parades and festivities always that is, always associated this took place. You know, women are fainting and cheering on the young men, and you get the idea. And so Lincoln had no problem raising 75,000 men, many, many, many more volunteered, and of course the equivalent in the South. The problem is none of these young men really have military experience. They've got to have officers. You know, where are we going to get things like uniforms? How are we going to get them guns? You know, it's one thing to have the, the, the young men. It's another thing to have a trained army. That's different. And a going argument started being passed around that the South was actually in a much better military situation. Even though the North is a lot bigger and there's a lot more people in the North, the South has the officers. You know, you know, the U U.S. Officer Corps is absolutely full of Southerners from these plantations, and they all joined the Confederacy. And so the Confederate Army was better organized at the beginning. The Union might have had access to more men. It's just the Confederacy was able to put together a good big army at a quicker pace. And a lot of people think that whatever is going to happen, it'll be resolved pretty soon. You know, either the South will secure its independence or the Union will put this down. Whatever's going to happen, by the end of the year, we will have resolved this. And to be honest with you, throughout the North, even though they don't support secession, there is kind of this going belief that the South will probably pull this off. It'll just be easier to let the South go. Lincoln was seen as, again, he's not a very experienced man. Given all that is going on, it is unrealistic to think that we can force the South to not form its own country. 
There's just a lot of reasons why there is a going belief that this, this would probably work out in the South's favor. But it's all going to end quickly is the idea. It's all going to end quickly. Winfield Scott comes up with a plan to subdue the South very quickly. I don't think I have a good map here of this. I'm sorry. I guess I'll use this one. Again, Winfield Scott was a brilliant military mind. There's no question about that. And goodness knows by 1861 he had, he had experience. Now again, he is old. He can't even mount his own horse because he's so overweight. And he has all kinds of health problems. But remember, he is deeply respected and Lincoln is really relying on him. You know, it was his loyalty at the beginning that kept Maryland in the Union. And so Lincoln really, really trusted him. And Winfield Scott comes up with a plan to capture Richmond and put this whole thing behind us. What he's going to do is send 35,000 men south from Washington, D.C. toward Virginia and capture a rail junction at Manassas, Virginia. And this would be in July. And Scott's logic is looking at the demographics on the ground, we can outnumber them pretty quickly. You know, Scott looks at this and realizes we can get several thousand more men into the field than the Southerners can if we act quickly. So if we strike real quick, we can take Virginia, capture their capital, and that would likely put an end to this whole mess. Well, of course, the South figured out what they were doing. And so the South put together a, 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 a very quick, quickly organized army of 25,000 men. That was the most, again, there's a lot of disorganization going on here. Lots of men to volunteer, very little organization in terms of how to get them trained and armed and in the field. And so in July, 35,000 Union soldiers marched from Washington, D.C. Toward, toward Richmond. 25,000 Southern troops marched north to stop them. And everybody knows we're about to have the first real battle of the war. I mean, it was pretty much known in the papers that this is going to take place. It was so obvious that actually sightseers showed up. And this is just a few miles south of Washington, D.C. And so Washington socialites all showed up in their carriages and brought their lunches to see all of this. And then the fighting started, and it was utter and complete chaos. I mean, these looky-loos learned real quick that it was a bad idea to show up where they know an active battle is going to take place. Neither side really knew what they were doing. None of the soldiers really had much training. They couldn't take orders very well. The artillery couldn't hit its targets because there had been no time to really train on that. It was basically just a big brawl on both sides. And it went back and forth all day long. But at the end of the day, when all, when all of the men are tired and nobody has really won, a fresh group of Southern soldiers showed up by rail and they marched to the battlefield and the Union soldiers panicked because they didn't know how many Southerners just arrived and it looked like they were just about to get steamrolled. And so the Union soldiers panicked, they broke, they started running back to Washington, D.C., completely disorganized. So the first big battle of the war was an overwhelming Southern victory. Jefferson Davis was actually there. Washington, D.C. was completely open to be captured. There was no defense of any kind. As a matter of fact, Jefferson Davis did not take Washington, D.C. because he thought his men were tired and he could do it over the next two or three days, which was a grave miscalculation, as, of course, we later know. The minute these soldiers got back, Scott got them back organized into lines. And so the next couple of days, it became very obvious to the South that they can't walk into D.C. But they could have done it on at the end of that battle. D.C. was wide open for a few hours. There was a little window there. 
where he could have just walked right in and moved into the White House if he wanted to. Anyway, what this means is that this is not going to be a short war. This is not going to be an easy war. Richmond is not going to be taken quickly. This is going to be nasty and it's going to be bloody. The first battle was the Battle of Manassas. The Battle of Manassas Junction, if you will. Now, the South would call it the Battle of Bull Run. So the two sides came up with their own name for it. But it is now plainly obvious that neither side is going to win this quickly. And it's also very obvious that this is going to be nasty. I mean, these, these battles are going to be horrific. About 2,500 men were killed at the Battle of Bull Run. And by the end of the war, that would be seen as a skirmish. You know, the battles that would end up taking place in 1862, 63, 64 would be tens of thousands killed, one battle after another. Just a staggering death toll on both sides as this turned into a nasty long war of attrition. And on that, I guess we're out of time. I'm sorry. Uh, but I went a little longer than I thought. But what do you say we stop now and uh, we'll talk about the war more on Thursday. And as I mentioned earlier, one more time, sorry about the mess up on the quiz. It is open again. And like I said, I'm going to keep the quiz open for several days beyond Sunday because why not? Okay, y'all take care.